Hello, welcome back. In this video, we are going to talk about risk adjusted expected return and also a first valuation model. And this one is going to be based on dividends. First, let's take a look at a general principle of valuation. The value of any investment is equal to the present value of its future cash flow. And here's just a reminder of the future va uh, present value formula. Uh, the present value of a single cash flow at points starting in time t is equal to the future cash flow divided by 1 plus the discount rate raised to the time period. So if the cash flow occurred in year 2 and you're computing the present value today, that will be year 0, then you would discount it back for 2 years. Um, Therefore, you can see that present value depends on three different factors. The first is the size of the cash flow. The second is the timing, because what time the cash flow occur uh, will affect the, new, uh, the expo exponent of the discount factor. And then, of course, the discount rate. This calculation gives us the present value on any single cash flow. So we refer to that as lump sum in finance. The value of an investment is the sum of the present value of all its future cash flows. Uh, and today means year zero. So when we use the, the number zero here to denote time, um, today will be year zero. So, and this summation sign, this is um, the Greek letter. Uh, so what this simply mean, means that we will add up the future cash flow from year one, two, three, four, all the way to year T. We will be using primary Excel to do our calculations, so I'll demonstrate that um, later on in this video. There's only one special case where we cannot use an Excel function, and that is the case of a growing perpetuity. As you know, a perpetuity is a cash flow that lasts forever. A growing per perpetuity is a special case where um, the cash flow is going to continue, but not at a fixed amount, but it's going to continue to grow at a fixed rate. So the value of a growing perpetuity depends on three things. One is the starting value of the cash flow. So that's the cash flow starting in year T plus one. Uh, the discount rate as well as the growth rate. Uh, an important characteristic of this growth rate is that since this is a growing perpetuity, this growth rate has to be constant forever. So this is a very long-term growth rate. And because, and um, as you can see, the val uh, it's only valid if the growth rate is smaller than the discount rate. So this is one of the assumptions behind a growing perpetuity. Let's take a look at a um, really quick, simple example. Uh, so I encourage you to open up Excel. So if you haven't done so, pause the video and open, open up Excel and type in this simple problem. So this problem has to do with a real estate investment. We assume that it will cost us $180,000 to buy this, um, this house, this property. It will cost um, $75,000 to remodel it in year one. And then you expect to be able to sell it in year two for $275,000. And initially, we're not going to borrow any money. So the discount rate and the discount rate is 10%. First, we're going to put the cash flow um, from this property into um, is per year. So this is year zero. Year zero, we purchase the property. So the cash flow is an outflow. So we spend $180,000. And year one, we also, this is also an outflow. We spend $75,000. And then in year two, we sell the property. So we get a positive cash flow of $275,000. Now, if you ignore the time value of money, um, then you will simply add up all the cash flow and you will conclude that you make $20,000 on this investment. But that's actually not true because the money that you 
invest the $180,000 in year zero, meaning today, and the $75,000 you put in year one, you could have invested that money somewhere else. And if you do, you'll be able to earn 10%. So that's what we mean by the opportunity cost in finance. Um, so, the, so in other words, if you um, put the $180,000 into the alternative investment in year one you earn 10 percent you have eighteen thousand dollars and then in year two uh, you earn a compound interest of that another ten percent on um, the hundred eighty thousand dollars plus the eighteen thousand dollars that you earn in year one so we want to take that into account and the way we do it is we compute the present value of future cash flow. So in this case, it's a little bit interesting because year one, the cash flow is still negative, but it doesn't change our um, calculation. So the function we use is NPV, as we have mentioned before. So the net present value function has two arguments. The first is the interest rate. So for us, that would be the 10%. And then the second is the value. And something very important, this is value starting in year one. So you can see, um, so the value is contained in the cash flows in year one and year two for this particular project. So our conclusion is that the present value of future cash flow is $159,000. So what is your profit? And instead of calling it prop, that take into account the time value of money. Instead of calling it the profit, we call it the net present value. So we put in $18,000, $180,000, and we get back in present value term $159,000. So we actually has a negative net present value, which means that this investment is not worth the $180,000. This investment is worth $159,000. And if it costs us $180,000 to purchase an investment that's only worth of value at $159,000, of course, that is not a good investment. Let's take a look at this um, opportunity cost from a different perspective. Uh, remember we said that 10% is the opportunity cost. So let's say um, you can put this in a mutual fund. And uh, this is a real estate mutual fund and you will be able to earn 10% on this mutual fund. You're gonna put in the investment the same as you would um, in this real estate project. So in year zero, let me just copy this down, much easier. Okay, so in year zero, there's no beginning balance. Uh, the investment in year zero is $180,000. Um, since we just put this in, um, we don't have any return. And the ending balance is simply the sum of beginning balance, investment, and return. Okay. And then the next year, we do the same thing. This is a very common um, accounting setup. So the beginning balance of year one is the ending balance of year zero. And in year one, our investment is $75,000. Our return is our last year's ending balance, right, times the 10%. So we will earn $18,000. And now we have an ending balance of $273,000. Um, so the same thing happened in year two. We can just copy this over. So in year two, we don't have any investment, right? Um, but we will still earn 10%. So, and our ending balance at the end of year two, we have been $300,300. But if we were to buy this property, we're only gonna get $275,000. So this, this illustrated that if I have $180,000 to invest in today and $75,000 invest in year one, with an opportunity cost of 10%, I should get $300,000. 
but this property is gonna is not gonna get that much so it's not is it doesn't pay for our opportunity cost so you can you can um, see where the discount rate the time value of money comes in if you ignore the time value of money um, in this analysis you will conclude that this is a profitable investment but if you take into account the time value of money of 10%, then this is not a valuable investment because this investment is only worth $159,000 and the cost is $180,000. So why would you pay some $180,000 for something that is worth or is value only at $159,000? Now let's take a look at the same example, except this time we're going to borrow part of our purchase cost. Um, we're still going to put in the remodeling without borrowing, but the initial purchase, we can get a, a mortgage. So we assume that we're going to borrow 40% and the interest rate is 6%. Um, interest expense is, we assume, is tax deductible. And now the discount rate is a little bit higher, it's 12%, because when you use leverage, that increases the risk of the firm. So um, a higher risk will require a higher um, required return. First, let's take a look at how much we'll be borrowing. Um, we're going to borrow 40% of our purchase price. So we're going to borrow 40% of $180,000. And the remaining, we're going to come up with on our own. So that's going to be our equity investment. Okay. So we're still buying a piece of property for $180,000. We'll borrow $72,000 and come up with $108,000 from on our own. So let's take a look at the cash flow consequences. So we're still paying the buyer or the seller of the property $180,000 in year zero. We're still going to pay out $75,000 in remodeling and we're going to get back $275,000. However, the bank is going to give us $72,000 and which we have to pay back at the end when we sell the property. We're going to assume that during the life of the loan, we only have to pay interest. So we have to pay interest of 6%, but it's after tax. So we multiply that by 1 minus the tax rate. And the interest will be the same for both years, since we're not paying down our debt until the very end. And now net total cash flow will be the sum of all these items. So as you can see in an interest should be an outflow. So let me make sure that's the case. So in year zero, of course, um, our net cash flow is our equity. We pay our $108,000. But in year one, in addition to the $75,000 remodeling, we have to pay interest on the $72,000 we borrow. So our outflow is $78,000. Um, and in year two, we put in, um, we have to pay back the bank. We also have to pay back interest. And we have, um, and we will be able to sell the property for $275,000. So our profit without taking into account the time value of money um, is the sum of these three. So that's our net cash flow. So we still make money. We still make $13,952 if we ignore the time value of money. But how much is this property actually worth? So let's compute that. Let's compute the value of this property. Remember, we can use the MPV function. And the first argument is the discount rate. The discount rate now is 12%. And our cash flow in year one is negative 78,000. And cash flow in year two is 199,000. So it turns out that our investment is worth $89,000. And now we're going to compare it to the 108,000 because this is what how much we're putting in as equity. So it is still 
not valuable because we're getting something that's worth 89,000, even though now it doesn't cost us 180, it only costs us 108,000. Um, in fact, you can once again subtract the difference between the two and it still is negative by $18,000. So this is very interesting. By borrowing money, we can actually reduce the, the negative, but it's still not enough to compensate for uh, the opportunity cost of 12%. These two examples illustrate the importance of taking into account the time value of money or the opportunity cost of money, and also show you how to use the net present value in Excel to help us compute uh, the discount future cash flow to compute the present value of future cash flows. Future cash flows are obvi obviously very important. So what are future cash flows for investment? Let's take a look at a, uh, the easiest uh, type of investments, which are bonds. These are the easiest because bond contracts typically are very specific. So when you purchase a bond or when a company issues bonds, um, they specify what the interest rate is. Um, we refer to that as coupon. Um, so usually this is paid on a semi-annual basis and based on the coupon rate and the part value of the bond you will figure out um, how much interest coupon interest you have to pay and you have to pay that on a regular basis the coupon payment days once uh, also is specified in the bond contract and you have to pay back the part value at maturity which is also stated in the bond contract so there are two types of cash flows for uh, for bonds um, the first is the coupon and then the second is or the interest. The second is the par value. So you have two types of cash flow. You know the timing of the cash flow. Again, those are specified in the contract. Um, it's very easy to, to determine. So bond is usually the first um, element that we introduce in um, investment valuation. But what about stocks? and other types of investments. The cash flows for stocks and other real investments are a little bit more complicated. First of all, there are typically no contracts to tell you exactly how much you'll get back when you purchase a stock or when you open a business or invest in a, uh, a, 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 part, uh, in a business partnership. So those are estimates only. The other um, interesting challenge is that we have this going concern assumption for bond in the bond contract we know how much we're going to get back at the end a maturity date but for a stock or a business we assume that the company is going to last it's going to keep going so there's no end time and because of this um, going concern assumption what we to, what we often do is to use it, the growing perpetuity um, assumption to summarize all the future cash flows into a single value. So an important assumption to keep in mind when we introduce growing perpetuity is that the growth rate that you use is assumed to last forever. And that's what perpetuity means, perpetual. And this growth rate cannot be greater than the discount rate. A proxy that is oftentimes used is the GDP growth or population growth, because remember this will last forever. So if you, if you assume that something is going to grow, let's say at 20%, uh, that may be true for one or two years, but 20% is not sustainable in perpetuity. Uh, a more reasonable assumption is something that will grow along with the average economy, which will be the GDP growth or grow with the population. As for cash flows for stock valuation, um, oftentimes, sometimes we'll use dividends, which are the actual cash that is paid to back to stockholders. Uh, if you are valuing a company as a whole, we'll look at free cash flow to the firm. Um, other, uh, another proxy that I oftentimes use are uh, um, earnings, and this can be comprehensive income, or it could be uh, earnings for uh, stockholders. So we'll talk about this, each of this assumption, each one of these will be its own individual model um, later on. 
we'll conclude the video here. Uh, in the next video, we're going to introduce um, the concept of risk-adjusted return and how discount rate um, reflects those different risks. See you soon.